Okay, so it's time, so let's get started. Um, good afternoon, my name is Minoru Ko. I'm from uh, Department of Systems Medicine. And uh, thank you for coming to the second lecture of Centennial Lecture Series of uh, uh, Keio University School of Medicine. Uh, we are celebrating 100 year history of Keio University School of Medicine. And uh, this school was founded in 1917 by two great teachers. Uh, as you know, uh, Yukichi Fukuzawa, uh, who is a founder of Keio University, and also who is, in a sense, uh, uh, one of the founders of modern Japan in Meiji uh, era. And the, the other person is, of course, uh, Shibasaburo Kitasato, who, is the, who was the first dean of our medical school, School of Medicine. And he is the world-renowned microbiologist and immunologist. Um, so those two people founded our School of Medicine. And uh, as I said, that we've been celebrating. And this lecture series is part of that celebration. And uh, so in that sense, the, uh, for us, it is an honor and great pleasure to have Dr. David Schlesinger, who is the NIH Distinguished Investigator, and uh, uh, coming uh, from the US to uh, give us uh, four lectures. And uh, today is the second lecture of the uh, uh, four lectures. Yesterday, um, we had uh, a great uh, lecture from him about the population-based genetic study, and particularly Sardinia project. And, uh, but he, uh, today, he is turning to more um, sort of, for us, more accessible developmental biology and uh, uh, some genomic subject. Um, Dr. Schlesinger, uh, let me uh, briefly introduce uh, Dr. Schlesinger's career a little bit. Uh, he started his research as undergraduate student at the University of Chicago. So you can see 1957, I think, or 55. And then he went on to a Harvard, Harvard University and started to work with uh, Jim Watson, as you know, the, uh, who discovered the DNA structure. And uh, then he's got a PhD. And then he went on to uh, Pasteur Institute and did a postdoc there with Jack Monod, uh, uh, another great uh, molecular biologist uh, in historically. And then he came back to the States and became assistant professor at the University of, uh, at the Washington University uh, School of Medicine in St. Louis. And then he basically uh, afterwards became professor and he's been, uh, he was uh, at the university for a long time. And then uh, he actually uh, uh, established the first genome center in, I think, in the worldwide, the first, literally the first genome center, who became a model for all the genome centers in worldwide. And so he made a seminal contribution to the Human Genome Project, of course. Um, then he went to uh, 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 NIH, uh, the National Institute on Aging, NIH, and uh, then uh, uh, he went on. So he is now a distinguished investigator of NIH, and, uh, 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 and, and then uh, he is still continuously uh, working and uh, guiding uh, many young investigators and scientists in the research activity. As I said uh, at the beginning, that today's lecture he turns into uh, this particular topic. Uh, title of his talk today is Developmental Genomics and Genetics, the Model of Skin Appendages. Dr. Strisinger, please. Uh, thank you, Minoru. Uh, it's uh, an honor and pleasure to be with you uh, at this auspicious uh, time and uh, to speak with you today about an attempt to analyze a developmental process using genomics and genetics. The process that we'll look at is the development of skin appendages. Um, these include uh, teeth, nails, hair follicles, and a variety of exocrine glands. 
uh, one of the reasons that we originally uh, focused on these is that they're physiologically quite important, but one can live without them. They're relatively dispensable, and they're easily accessible because they're on the surface as a developmental model. We'll look to some extent at hair follicles, but much more at several of the skin exocrine glands. Uh, just to remind you that the exocrine glands secrete substances through ducts uh, into the external environment and not into the bloodstream. Uh, and we'll speak today about two of them, uh, which are of particular interest uh, as we age, uh, the meibomian glands in the uh, eyelid, uh, which secrete an oil that prevents the evaporation of uh, tears, and in their absence, we, and in the elderly, we suffer from dry eye, uh, and sweat glands, which are involved in thermoregulation. Um, the sweat glands across our body are capable of sweating uh, up to one to four liters per hour, which makes humans one of the few animals that can run long distance. Um, in addition, in the elderly, again, uh, their uh, dysregulation of thermoregulation and that becomes a, a question of interest as well. The entry point into this work uh, was a physiological condition, a medical condition, known as anhydrotic ectodermal dysplasia, or EDA. Uh, EDA is X-linked, uh, so it's an autosomal disease, usually autosomal recessive. Uh, there are over 200 clinically distinguishable ectodermal dysplasias, and EDA is the most frequent. Uh, and you see in this young boy, for example, sparse hair, he has no sweat glands or meibomian glands, and abnormally uh, primitive teeth. EDA has a long history appropriate for the centennial celebration. It was actually first reported by Charles Darwin. This is not Darwin's book on the origin of species, it's his other work in which he looked worldwide at variation of animals and plants when they were domesticated. And he found a family uh, in India uh, which had the uh, EDA symptoms, the EDA characteristics. Um, he could see, for example, that daughters in the family never had the condition, but their sons often did. He did not know about chromosomes or Mendel's laws, and he just puzzled about what was happening. But he did describe the condition. Uh, 75 years later, Falconer found a spontaneously developed tabby mouse, a mouse mutant, which recapitulates uh, most of the features of EDA. It's a pretty good model, and we'll use it extensively in the work I'll describe. Uh, as part of the uh, benefits of the Genome Project, uh, we were able to clone the gene broken in the cases of EDA in 1996, um, a project led by Yuha Kere, who incidentally is now at King's College London, but is on sabbatical at Riken in Yokohama. And uh, Anna Srivastava in our lab at the same time showed that the same gene was broken in the tabby mouse. In the following few years, the Overbeak lab uh, cloned what was the specific receptor of EDA, a specialized receptor, EDAR, and the EDAR ADD gene, a co adapter for this receptor. EDA is a very interesting molecule. It's actually a paracrine hormone. It's released by cells near where the skin appendages will arise and binds to uh, EDAR. It's produced by the neighboring cells, uh, goes to the membrane, and is cleaved off to form a soluble ligand, which is what binds to the EDA receptor. Over a number of years, uh, our lab and other labs have uh, cooperated in determining features of the EDA signaling pathway. So again, um, at the beginning of skin appendages, there's already been a bit of uh, wind signaling uh, activity and then EDA increases it greatly uh, when it binds to its receptor. It then activates uh, the NF-kappa B, 
the powerful NF-kappa-B transcription factor system to act on target genes. Uh, and uh, the, all these points at which asterisks are shown uh, ha are patient, have patient uh, uh, conditions which mimic EDA by the mutations in those particular parts of the pathway. So it supports the uh, integrity of the pathway in producing the EDA uh, uh, condition. Uh, we've been also been able to see that a number of uh, signaling pathways are involved in a cascade initiated by EDA and leading finally to the uh, various skin appendages. So regarding the developmental action of EDA, we'll talk about four topics uh, today. First, we'll review the requirement for EDA action for the various skin appendages. Then we'll look at the initiation of the approach I'll talk about, the identification of EDA target genes as effectors of its action. And then we'll look at two specific mechanisms, parts of the actual process, two of them early on in the process, uh, RELB, part of the uh, NF-kappa-B family, and the way in which it leads from the EDA ligand to begin gene transcription, and then an inhibitor that helps to break the action and lead to the next phase of uh, development. So we'll look at two early target genes and their action, and then we'll go to the end of the process and look at two EDA target genes that are acquired after the sweat glands or other skin appendages have been formed, but looking at the secretory function and regulating that. So this is an initial slide to show you part of the EDA requirement, and basically we're comparing the wild-type mouse to the tabby mouse. The wild-type mouse, uh, the tabby mouse has, has lost the dark, long guard hairs and retains an aberrant form of the remaining types of hair. Uh, it's lost hair on the tail. Uh, it has no uh, sweat glands. In the mouse model, the sweat glands are conveniently located on the foot pads, so we can separate them easily from hair follicles and look at them separately. Um, it also has none of the meibomian glands in the, in the eye, uh, so that the tabby mouse um, ultimately develops uh, eye problems and goes blind compared to the wild type. The loss of EDA gene, then, if we look at it in detail, for example, here looking at the sweat glands, uh, in the tabby mouse, there's a start, this pre-EDA step, where you begin to have a bit of swelling, whereas in the wild type, at the same time, you already have the bud that's going to turn into the sweat gland. Uh, and if you look at different times along a time course, you can see the progression in the wild type to form, uh, in this case, the full sweat gland, whereas in the tabby mouse, something starts, but it even disappears with time. We then found uh, that both for the sweat glands and the other skin appendages, if we supplied a transgene with a cDNA of the uh, full message for the EDA gene, we could restore all of the missing phenotypes. So in this case, we're looking at the hair on the tail, which is abundant in the wild-type mouse, completely absent in the tabby, and totally restored uh, in the uh, uh, transgenic mouse. I should point out this transgene is ev active everywhere in the mouse, but only in the cells that are making the EDA receptor does it have its effect. So you only see the effect on the skin appendages. Um, another example, uh, if you look for sweat glands, they're abundant and clear in the foot pad of the wild type mouse totally absent in the tabby mouse, which just shows some fibrosis left, uh, and restored completely in the transgenic mouse. Uh, this is an alternate way of looking at sweat glands by function uh, that you'll see a number of times in the talk. If you look at the wild type, 
at the digits on the foot, on the paw, you can see these purple spots. Each of those spots represents sweating. Uh, and the test is very simple. Iodine in a solution is provided to the uh, surface of the paw, and wherever there's sweating, there's water, and the iodine turns purple. You can also see the spots clearly in the transgenic, and they're totally absent in the tabby mouse. Similarly, the, again, just to show you the restoration by the EDA uh, isoform, um, tabby mice, in contrast to the wild type, show significant corneal defects that are progressive, um, including neovascularization and uh, actual breaks in the surface. And in fact, uh, this mouse model has now become a model for uh, looking at optical surface disease. Um, again, in the tabby, we have the uh, blindness developing because of dry eye. And in fact, the uh, EDA patients suffer greatly from dry eye as well. Um, and again, the transgenic uh, mouse completely rescues the phenotypes for the uh, corneal defect and also for the uh, uh, meibomian gland. Now we turn to the actual work that we've done to try to begin to investigate mechanism. So the basic idea is straightforward. In order to identify EDA target genes <coughs> overall, the initial strategy was to use genomics to look in the areas where the skin appendages are forming in the wild type and look at the gene expression profile compared to what's going on in tabby mice at the same time. So you can look at back skin in embryonic and adult stages to have an idea of what's happening in the hair follicles in the wild type, which genes have been um, initiated and um, are expressed at different times and are absent in expression, and of course, in the tabby mouse. Uh, foot pad skin in embryonic and adult gives us a mirror of uh, sweat gland function. Uh, the eyelids have been used uh, for meibomian glands in embryonic and adult. And we've also used some standard keratinocyte cell lines for some of the work. And the result of this, uh, just to show again the tissues, the wild type and tabby for the hair follicles, by uh, near birth, the hair follicles are completely formed, totally absent in the tabby. Um, sweat glands, again, fully developed after birth uh, in the wild type and totally gone in the tabby. When we looked for these target genes, a certain number stood out in the microarray analyses. There's some Wnt genes, some genes associated with sonic hedgehog, BMP4, and one of the uh, NF kappa B, the five NF kappa B uh, transcription factors. So we get target pathways, and we see NF kappa B transcription factors in the Wnt pathway, sonic hedgehog, BMP, other, and some other transcription factors, which we'll come back to, which come up late in the process. Well, um, this is unfortunately where most of the genomic work tends to stop, and it's very puzzling. We all recognize these signaling pathways, but they're almost universal. We keep seeing them in different uh, uh, developmental pathways. So how do you generate different developmental fates with the same set of pathways? And in fact, how do you uh, generate different uh, skin appendages with the same pathways? In order to begin to analyze this, now we'll look at some of the early steps that are involved, and uh, we'll turn to biochemistry as our help. So we'll look at, again, at the action of two EDA target genes that are active early on, RELB and then uh, DKK4. This is an activator of EDA, and this is a break on EDA function. The question is, how does interaction of EDA with EDAR actually turn on specific genes that were not being transcribed before? And this is the overall view. Uh, 
actually none of this work is published yet, and this is the first public presentation of it. It's work by a, a, a postdoctoral fellow in my group, John Sima. Uh, you see the course of what happens overall. EDA binds to the EDA receptor and the co-activators. It then activates specifically and strongly two of the five NF-kappa B transcription factors, uh, P50 and REL-B, which form a complex, and a minor activation also of REL-A, which we won't talk about further today. But the REL-B and P50 are activated along with a linker protein. And the linker protein, TFG, makes a link between the transcription factor and a switch sniff chromatin remodeling complex. So the transcription factor goes to its cognate sites and binds, but it has the linker protein bound to it, and that recruits a chromatin remodeling complex, which then opens up the chromatin at those locations, at the EDA target genes, uh, acting through an F-kappa B, and initiates uh, transcription, and we'll show you uh, some data for a few target genes. So that's the overall view. Um, and I'll show you some of the underlying evidence for this. First of all, the uh, fact that P50 and REL-B are the major NF-kappa-B complex that mediates uh, EDR, EDA uh, signaling. Um, this can be done, for example, in keratinocyte cultures, and we transfect them um, with EDA and EDAR, or without, just an empty vector. And you can see the enormous increase in the levels of P50 and REL-B in particular. Uh, in the nucleus, we see the same thing. Substantial uh, uh, increases in P50 and REL-B and nothing uh, in the uh, empty transfection with the empty vector. So the major NF-kappa B complex that is initiated is the P50 REL-B complex. Just parenthetically, that's very different from the major immune system effects of uh, NF-kappa B, where it's REL-A, okay? Um, uh, this is a repeat in which uh, we take an oligo representing the binding site in the, in the, uh, uh, in the genome for NF-kappa B, and we show that uh, material accumulates after a transfection with EDAR, uh, and of course it includes P50 and REL-B, as well as some REL-A, that bind to the oligo. Uh, so it's a pull-down experiment with the oligo in this case. As you might expect, if you compare, in this case, the meibomian glands in the eyelid with immunohistochemistry, uh, you can see P50, the green fluorescence, uh, very highly uh, uh, represented um, in the wild type, but not seen at all in the tabby mouse. And similarly, REL-B, with an antibody to REL-B, is seen. This is the part of the evidence that there is this novel complex induced by EDA signaling. A uh, complex of the NF-kappa B subunits, the P50 REL-B, with switch sniff, and we've called that the EDA-induced BAF. BAF is the name of the particular switch sniff complex that's activated. Uh, it's a complex that's characterized by a particular uh, protein, BAF250A, and several others. If we take an extract of cells in which there's been activation by EDA, uh, and run it on a sizing column. And we then um, collect all the fractions that contain REL-B, for example, or uh, contain BAF-170, one of the components of the BAF complex. And now we do immunoprecipitation. If we use an antibody against BAF-170, you can see that a series of proteins are uh, immunoprecipitated and then identified by uh, uh, either by antibodies to them or by mass spec, uh, and that includes uh, BAF250A 
and EDA-specific components, RELB and P50, um, and also another protein that appears. For example, here we see this protein. We also see it if we precipitate with an antibody to RELB, TFG. TFG is the linker protein, and in further experiments we see that TFG can bind both to RELB and to a particular component of the BAF uh, complex, the switch sniff complex, BAF45D. So this is one of the experiments that was done. All of these individual components of the BAF complex were synthesized in vivo um, with a marker, a tag on them, and then we precipitate with TFG and see whether any of them is co-precipitated. And a single one, the BAF45D, is precipitated along with TFG. Similarly, if we take all of the uh, NF-kappa B subunits and we ask which are, if any are precipitated with GFG, one is precipitated and it's RELB. This is part of the evidence that um, RELB is making the complex with TFG and TFG then recruits the switch sniff complex. Uh, these are just reciprocal uh, uh, immunoprecipitations to show that this works in both directions with the different proteins. One might expect that if this um, view of what's happening is true, that the BAF components would all be required to have the function of NF of uh, NF kappa B and EDA, so we made skin specific knockout mice, which are selectively uh, lacking BAF 250A, or we took cultures of various uh, 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 mouse samples and knocked down BAF 250A. Here's an example of again of the hair follicles and wild type skin. And instead, if instead we have the skin knockout of BAF-250A, we get the same primitive version of the hair follicles that's seen in the tabby mouse. Um, this is an example in which uh, Jansima has done organ cultures of the eyelid from an embryonic stage and infected it with uh, lentivirus, either a control that's empty or a control with an shRNA against RELB or TFG or BAF45D. Uh, the meibomian gland grows enormously in vitro and grows not at all if any of these components of the BAF complex or RELB are knocked down. We've pushed this to look at uh, sample gene targets by looking uh, in microarray studies, going back to the genomics, at targets of both switch sniff and EDA signaling. Uh, and here are two of the prominent ones. Um, this is lymphotoxin beta, which we had already studied and knew was a target of uh, EDA and comes up very strongly uh, in these experiments. And another one, TNFRSF9. This is actually uh, an interesting gene which is very active in skin appendages in human is not EDA responsive in mouse. So these are experiments in uh, human keratinocyte cells. Um, these are experiments here uh, in which uh, the messenger RNA is seen uh, after transfection with EDA. Um, and we look at the uh, mRNA fold that you see um, with the full uh, uh, EDA, EDAR transfection, or when we counteract its action, knockouts for LD, knockout for TFG, knockout for BAF45KD. Uh, uh, similarly, if we do chip assays, if we precipitate chromatin with RELB, we find uh, very high levels selectively done if we induce with uh, uh, the uh, fold uh, EDAR, and those are sharply lowered uh, if we have the uh, knockout. 
If we precipitate with BAF250A, again, we can initiate uh, these uh, LTB, in this case, at high levels. And similarly, we see again the uh, relevant uh, transcription uh, in cells here of the TNFRSF9 with an antibody to it, um, which uh, co uh, uh, immunofluoresces with an EDAR marker. Uh, finally, for this part of the talk, uh, this is one of a large set of DNAs1 hypersensitivity assays where we've taken HACAT uh, uh, keratinocyte cell lines um, and transfected them either again uh, with an empty vector um, or with EDA-EDAR and then asked whether specific sites in the cells um, are opened up to uh, DNA uh, digestion. That's certainly true if we just have uh, EDA-EDAR added if we add any of, if we block any of the components we've talked about, rel B uh, or the BAF components, there's no increase in the rate of DNA one hypersensitivity. So the overall uh, result here again is that what EDA and EDAR do at the beginning of their action is first to turn on rel B and P50, specific uh, NF kappa B transcription factors. They find their cognate promoters, and they also are bound to TGF, which recruits BAF and opens the chromatin for transcription. Now, once the initial phase, the first parts of skin appendage formation have begun uh, in this cascade, you have to begin the next phase. So somehow you have to turn off what's going on and initiate something else with a new set of target genes. I'll show you one of the factors that contributes to modulate uh, the action of EDA. And we see that in outline here. Uh, so the question is, how do stages in early gland development stop or are, are get modulated? And the, one of the contributing factors is a protein called DKK4. Uh, there are several DKK family members. These are inhibitors of the Wnt pathway, which is the signaling pathway turned on first by EDA. Um, DKK1 is extremely powerful, and it turns off all Wnts. It's not found in skin. Instead, we find a DKK4, but it's induced by EDA. So EDA induces a number of Wnt uh, system pa uh, uh, members, but it also induces an inhibitor of the pathway. The inhibitor limits the action of Wnt, and then in a further step, the inhibitor itself is cleaved and disappears. So you have a feedback uh, inhibition in which DKK4 itself tends to limit and end the EDA function, and then it disappears. Um, here's some of the underlying uh, information. Uh, DKK4 itself is very powerful if you add enough of it. If you have a transgene, for example, it really blocks all the hair formation in the tabby mouse. So even the remaining hair can be gone, responds to uh, remaining uh, Wnt activity and is turned off. Uh, DKK1, as I mentioned, uh, is very active against all the winds. So here if we look, these are assays in which we're assaying with top flash, which is a, an assay for the turn on of beta catenin, the, the signal from the uh, wind pathway. And we supply to cell cultures uh, different winds that we've made in vitro, wind 3A, wind, wind 1, wind 2. Um, all of them are turned off if we add uh, DKK1. Uh, as a transgene, uh, as, as, that is by transfection. But only a few are modulated by DKK4, and these are exactly the ones that are active in the skin appendages. So it's quite selective. Um, and then this DKK4 itself is sensitive to proteolytic cleavage, and cleave DKK4 no longer inhibits the wince. 
Um, this is just to show you um, in cell lines in which we've uh, made DKK4 that you begin to have the cleaved product as well as the intact product. If you look with time in vivo, first you see the intact product and then it gets cleaved and the inhibition is lost as the winds are also turning off. Um, this is a, another gel to look at the cleave product compared to the other. This is the actual cleavage site. Uh, and if we make a form in which the cleavage site is um, uh, changed so that the, uh, it's not recognized by the uh, cleaving enzyme, uh, then it persists as DKK4. So in this case, CDA induces wind function, but it also induces a feedback inhibitor of wind, this DKK4. And then the DKK4 inhibition is transient. So the net wind function is very timed and very sensitive to the levels of DKK4 in wind. Uh, it, it's an indication, again, of how um, exquisitely refined the developmental pathway is. Now let's proceed to the other end of the developmental pathway. And we'll look at some mechanistic questions about the secretory function of the skin exocrine glands. We saw in uh, the work that we were doing on the early uh, uh, microarray results that late in the development of the sweat glands, two transcription factors appear that were not present earlier and they appear specifically in the sweat glands, uh, FOXA1 and FOXC1. These are members of the uh, forked winged helix uh, transcription factor family that's incredibly uh, powerful in, in uh, development. And different FOXs are active in different developmental processes. Uh, this is some of the early evidence that uh, we had. If we look during the formation of the secretory portion in the duct of the sweat glands in mice, um, where most of the sweat gland formation occurs after birth. Um, we see the EDA, we see sonic hedgehog, which is very active at early stages and then disappears. And then we see FOXA1 and FOXC1 as well, rising only very late in the process. The question is, what are they doing? So FOXA1 was dramatically downregulated in the adult sweat glands. Uh, it's previously been known as a gene that's active in certain endodermal uh, development, um, regulating the development of those organs. But it hadn't been seen in ectoderm-derived sweat glands before. And so we continued to analyze its function. And how would we begin to analyze its function? First, we found that FOXA1 was specifically expressed in the sweat gland. So by this time, the developmental pathway is quite specific. It's never seen in hair follicles or in epidermis. And you do see it as the uh, pink fluorescence here within the cells of the sweat glands. What we did was, as you might expect from what I've said earlier, we generated skin-specific FOXA1 knockout mice. And the standard way we do this uh, is to have LOXP sites in the FOXA1 gene and uh, cross it with a uh, Cree under a keratin promoter that's specific for the uh, uh, skin appendage. And this leads to skin restricted FOXA1 minus, so we don't hurt the endoderm function of the FOXA1. Then we ask for the fox knockout mice, do they have, does it have a phenotype in sweating? And it does. The wild type is seen here, again here, very clear, all these sweat spots, and nothing in the fox A1's uh, knockout. So somehow it's required in the final stages of sweat gland formation. Again, a route to figuring out what's going on um, was to take a look further at what was happening first functionally. And what we saw was that the sweat gland was essentially completely formed as far as we could tell, but the secretory portion was blocked by eosinophilic material. So in the wild type, this is cross sections of uh, uh, ducts of the uh, 
sweat glands, and you can see these open lumens, and there's clearly a lot of material piling up uh, in the sweat glands of the uh, knockout mice. The eosinophilic material turns out to be glycoprotein. These are various stains to show that uh, you can identify this, again, as material stuffing up the uh, ducts of the sweat glands and absent completely in the wild type. Then how is the FOXA1 deficiency linked to anhydrosis? So we want to know the downstream targets. And again, we turn first to genomics. We ask by gene expression profiling, which genes that are targets of FOXA1 appear in the sweat glands and the FOXA1 positive and are absent in the sweat glands that are non-functional. Uh, and the results were quite striking that, of course, FOXA1 is gone uh, compared to the wild type. But one other gene stood out, BEST2. Um, this is a member of a small family, Bestrophin genes, uh, which have been suggested as implicated in secretory function, one of them in uh, the gut. Uh, and so this is another one which had never been previously seen physiologically. The BEST2 itself, again, was undetectable in the knockout sweat glands. So if you look for the BEST2 messenger RNA, it's gone in the knockout compared to the wild type, as is, of course, the FOXA1 itself. And BEST2 protein is gone in Western blots. Uh, and BEST2 immunohistochemistry, where it co-localizes with FOXA1 in specific cells of the sweat gland, is also gone in the FOXA1 knockout. So this evidence suggested that BEST2 is a critical target of FOXA1. And if so, you might expect that BEST2 knockout mice may be anhydrotic. Once again, the, you combine the genomics with genetics, and you find anhydrosis or uh, almost complete anhydrosis in the best two knockout animals compared to the wild type. So um, in the best two knockout mice, pushing it a bit further, again, we see the lumens blocked in exactly the same way. So what comes out of this is that best two is a major functional target of FOXA1 in the sweat glands. And it is likely directly involved in the secretory process. Now, what about the other transcription factor we'd seen, FOXC1? Um, we cut to the chase in this case and made FOXC1 ablated mice, and they're also anhydrotic. Um, here you see the wild type and the FOXC1 without sweat spots. Uh, it, this gene was previously known as functioning in the eye, uh, and now we see this critical function in the sweat glands. Again, the sweat glands are blocked with material in the FOXC1 uh, knockout. This is a paper, uh, work of Chang Yi Tsui, which was just published in uh, uh, Journal of Investigative Dermatology. Interestingly, um, these mice recapitulate the features of a human sweat retention disorder, miliaria. Um, and just as in miliaria, for uh, dermatologists who may be in the audience, you get um, uh, blisters uh, in the upper surface of the skin, and you also get papules arising from deeper, um, very similar to what you would see in patients. Uh, and in fact, if you compare them, you have the hypohydrosis or anhydrosis in both the mouse model and in the human patients, the skin blisters and papules, the keratotic plug formation, um, the dilation of the lumens, which hasn't been really well characterized here, but is likely, and secondary inflammation, which also occurs in both. Uh, we don't have enough patients to see whether this might actually be a gene affected in the human patients or not. Once again, we could push this a bit further with the expression profiling. So here we're asking about expression profiling of wild type compared to the knockout FOXC1 
uh, regions of the sweat gland clusters. And here we see that in this case, the FOXC1 was acting as a negative repressor of certain genes in the, sw in the sweat gland material. Uh, there are a number of terminal differentiation markers which were very significantly upregulated in the knockout. Uh, these are all uh, proteins that are found in uh, uh, keratin uh, uh, terminal differentiation. Um, in the sweat gland, they're being expressed ectopically. They're not expressed in normal wild-type sweat glands, even at late stages. So they're being held down by the action of FOXC1, and the, in the knockout, they appear. Uh, so they actually change the terminal differentiation program of the normal keratinocytes in this case. Um, and in fact, um, in cellular models, uh, if we uh, have cells like um, 308 uh, a mouse keratinocyte cell line uh, with or without calcium added, it makes an awful lot of this terminal uh, protein, SPR2A. Um, but if we add a transgene containing FOXC1, the formation is all repressed. So the FOXC1 transgene represses the expression in keratinocytes, and that keeps the lumens open for the sweat secretion. So these are the lessons from, uh, that I've described from the EDA skin appendage model. Um, EDA initiates, uh, as a paracrine hormone, the cascade of genes that form skin appendages. And we looked at a couple of features of what's going on. Uh, the expression profiling reveals downstream target genes in this very fine-tuned program. Uh, we saw part of the action early on uh, with DKK4 as a break on early Wnt action, and this newly defined RELB TFG BAF complex that links the uh, EDA ligand in an EDA-induced BAF complex for gene activation. Uh, I should point out that there have been some recent discussions of uh, uh, cooperation between transcription factors and chromatin remodeling, because you have to open up chromatin. Uh, this is the first case where it's been seen in a developmental system. Uh, and for sweat secretion at the other end of the process, we saw that there are two transcription factors specifically uh, induced one of them that's required for secretion through a downstream uh, target of BEST2, and the other one that regulates the formation of proteins, which if made, would clog the sweat gland ducts. So these mechanisms are only partial. They may, however, exemplify a more general paradigm for gene activation, both in the developmental process and perhaps in the regulation of secretory systems. Um, I want to add, however, that, uh, of course, these answers are still quite partial. Every answer raises new questions, and here are some of them. Even looking early on, how are EDA and EDAR expression themselves regulated? How does EDA manage to selectively activate only some NF-kappa-B components, and how does it activate the linker protein TFG? Uh, what are NF-kappa-B and switch SNF really doing physically to open up the chromatin? Uh, almost certainly DNA methylation and histone uh, modulation are going to be involved, and how are they involved indeed? Uh, we haven't talked at all about during mid-development, uh, where sonic hedgehog is activated and then extinguished. We don't know anything about the action of BMP. Um, and even after sweat glands are formed, uh, how is the sweat secretion controlled by nervous impulses? What actually happens in the elderly to make it difficult for them to regulate uh, temperature so that we find some old people dying in their homes without air conditioning? Uh, what ion channels and cells account for sweat production? A uh, topic that we know a bit about, but that I didn't cover today. So there's an enormous amount to do. Uh, and in closing, I'd like to specifically point out that uh, in addition to some collaborating uh, labs in a number of places, most of the work I've described was uh, 
done in our laboratory by three Japanese trained uh, MD, PhD dermatologists, Chang Tsui and Makoto Kunisada and Tsuyoshi Hashimoto. Uh, and then the new work on the uh, activation complex was done by John Sima, uh, current postdoctoral fellow. Uh, there's a lot of talent in the field, and uh, we can hope that many of the questions that I continue, continue to raise uh, will be solved in much less than 20 more years of research. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. David Schlesinger. Uh, this is uh, Masayuki Amagai uh, from Department of Dermatology. So I moderate the uh, discussion part of his lecture. So uh, Dr. Schlesinger really uh, presented his remarkable finding. It all started from the identification of BBA genes. The BBA itself, was, uh, I, I knew today that uh, was first described by Darwin. Yes. <laughs> about uh, 200 years ago. Well, it's in. Then after, after he um, uh, identified the responsible, uh, important series of gene product, uh, which works in downstream of DDA, and it's all sort of involved in the uh, uh, hair follicle and sweat gland development. And it's really remarkable that uh, you really identify all the way to the uh, uh, molecule. Thank you. So any question, comment? Oh, yes. Uh, Kosaki, Kosaki from yes, Medical yes. Genetics. And I was really impressed with your finding that um, swift sniff complex is involved in appendage formation because mutation in those uh, proteins involved in this complex leads to uh, intellectual disabilities. Yes. Uh, collectively called Coffin series syndrome, uh -huh. which is characterized by lack of nails or hyperplasia of nails. Yeah. So I, I would think that uh, there is some correlation to that. Yeah. And my question is, in those patients, their hair grows rather rapidly. And the hair is a part of appendage, so I, if, I was wondering if you can give any uh, plausible explanation for this observation. Well, it's early times because, as I pointed out, when you see the same signaling pathways for all skin appendages, there must be modulations. And hair follicles clearly have a second pathway that remains with the secondary hair in the mice and for the sparse hair that it remains in people. So again, it's not an exocrine gland. So if there's going to be a split, it'll be there. Uh, and there are other differences. But uh, there hasn't been any investigation. It's an interesting question. OK, Ruiz san uh, I'm Yuki Fruich from uh, Dermatology Department. So I'm very interested. Uh, I'm really enjoyed your talk, and I'm really interested in uh, DKK4. Mm -hmm. And so I'm sorry, I forgot the model mice of DKK. You show me the model mice DKK4. Uh, that is a uh, overexpression model or a knockout model. The the one that I showed you, which was so violent and just suppressing everything, was a transgene. So it's at high levels there. Thank you very much. With, so with limited levels, it's less. I should add the, these Dickhoff proteins, DKK1 and especially in DKK4. DKK1 has no cleavage site, and that's one reason why it's so strong. DKK4 is transient because it's always open to being cut. Yeah, I'm, I'm so interested in why DKK4 transgene mouse have a clear phenotype, but uh, DKK4 has weak... Uh, Weak inhibi inhibitory uh, activi uh, yeah. activity compared to DKK1, and it has a cleavage site. So, two, two, two points. One of them is that I was describing the weak activity in sweat glands, mm -hmm. and it was the strong activity was seen in the hair follicles. Okay, okay. but uh, also the transgene is at higher level, so you're, it's both the timing of the expression, mm -hmm. the timing of the cleavage 
and the level of the, of the protein that's produced that combine to see the net effect. See. Uh, and I think we'll see that again and again in developmental pathways, that there are modulators and you can have a tremendous variation, as we do. I mean, look at the difference in the number of hair follicles between individuals and, the, and so on. The, uh, it's true that uh, perhaps of all the, of the skin appendages uh, that we're looking at, it's the hair follicles that are most of in interest to people as they get older. But the others are also very important. Thank you very much. Any other question? Kubo-san? Oh, thank you very much. I'm uh, Aki Kubo from this dermatology department, and I conducting the genetic diseases in this department of dermatology. And uh, uh, one disease that is an X-linked congenital skin disease in continentia pigmenti, yes. that is a deficiency in Nemo. Yes. The patient shows the T's deficiency, and also they um, uh, their skin symptom is yes. in a par uh, stripe pattern, and they lack the hair follicles. Right. In the and uh, in nemo, nemo deficiency, there's a very severe inflammation. Yeah. So it is a defect of the uh, hair development, the teeth development, is dependent on such an uh, NF kappa B pathway or the secondary result of the severe inflammation? No, the, the, the general thinking is that we've tried to analyze this by using patients who had more or less extreme phenotypes, but it's clear that the, the uh, incontinent pigmenti is doing more. The NEMO has other functions because NF-kappa B has other functions. So this is part of what's going on. So you see the effects in the EDA system, but it's not as specific as starting from EDA you're getting a lot of other uh, auxiliary effects. The, uh, it's just too powerful, the NF-kappa B. You're getting immune effects and so on as well. Thank you very much. Any other question? Yes. Hi, I'm Takeshi Matsui from Riken IMS. I'm, I'm very interested in, I'm very interested in the, your uh, sweat grant, role of sweat grant. Uh, Grand, uh, because your mice uh, lost the uh, sweat grant, mm -hmm. and that means uh, some regulation of the skin specific some regulation may be altered. Mm -hmm. So, is there any phenotype? What do you think? Well, you anecdotally, imagine? the mice are more uh, sensitive to temperature, but uh, for uh, rules of cruelty to animals, we don't do the experiment directly. Unfortunately, there are times when the heating system uh, turns on or the air conditioning goes off, and then we do see effects. So I think they are dependent on it, as we would be. Uh, they just have a restricted number in the paws. Thank you very much. So, so otherwise, those mice, without any sweat, they uh, follow the normal lifespan or yes, any, any major? They're a tiny, they're somewhat smaller. Uh, smaller. But uh, they mate easily and they, they grow and divide. They're, they're all right otherwise. They, uh, because the mouse sweat only in the palms, not, yeah. not the other part of the body. It's different from human yeah. being. Yeah. But makes without it, sweating... Yeah. Makes it easier to, to study. You don't have the confusion yeah, yeah, yeah. of hair follicles and, sa and uh, uh, sebaceous glands and so on. <laughs> Any other question? Okay. Oh. And you? Thank you for your great talk. Um, I have a simple question. Uh, you showed uh, you showed a lack of hair, uh, tail hair in tabby mouse, mm -hmm. uh, but I think. Uh, hair follicle stem cell. There are hair follicle stem cell. So, is it maintenance in tabby mouse? The 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 hair follicle question is is somewhat different because there are clearly two pathways to hair follicles. There's the EDA dependent one for the guard hair, but the secondary hair is still formed in the usual tabby mice, 
Uh, and it's not clear the extent to which EDA is involved in that. Okay, it was sensitive to DKK4, so it's certainly involved in WINT, but it's not been worked out exactly what the relationship is. Thank you. So, so following his question, yeah. Tabby mouse or EDA knockout mouse, they only have tail hair loss, but not the other part of hair is kind of intact. The, all the guard hair is gone. So these are these long, dark hairs, which are protective. Those are completely sensitive to EDA. The other hairs are still formed. They're a little bit uh, uh, malformed, but they're there. But uh, they, they do the hair cycle. Yes, there's yeah. an independent pathway for, the, for so, some but of the in, hair. In case of human EDA, they basically lose entire hair? Am I no, correct? No, they have sparse hair, but they still sparse have hair. some. Well, including scalp hair. Yeah, yeah, they still have some. Any other question? Yes, Hayato? Ms. Hayato Takashi, thank you for our lecture. So the DNA hypersensitivity assay, mm -hmm. uh, EDA, uh, actually induced a drastic change of chromatin structure. Yes. Basically open the structure, right? Yes, that's consistent yes. with this idea that it's recruiting this chromatin remodeling complex. It's just a demonstration that it's done it. Yes. And my question is, during the tissue or, uh, organ development, the uh, uh, chromatin structure can become uh, closed again after they become open. I have no idea. I think it's a good question. You, uh, you, someone may be interested in studying that. I'm glad that you're so interested in the material. <laughs> no, there's no information about that. Uh, um, of course, for hair follicles, they're cycling, so you're still having formation. The others are finished glands. I don't think there's any later formation of sweat glands or something like that. So in those cases, uh, either the chromatin has closed off, or in any case, it's not functioning. Remember that uh, many of these activating factors like sonic hedgehog are themselves shut down. So you couldn't get a new sweat gland again. Um, that's why therapy with EDA, for ED, for, with, the, with the hormone for EDA deficient people uh, can be imagined for sweat glands because you can supply it to the blood after birth. But for hair follicles, it's uh, uh, too late. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. Any other question? Yes, again. <laughs> then after him, I'm expecting a question from younger generation. <laughs> you are young, other people are younger. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Uh, another comment from a syndromic standpoint of view. Uh -huh. uh, you mentioned that the sonic hedge pathway is critical in the last slide, but you didn't specifically mention about uh, sonic hedge uh, involvement in the uh, hair foli I mean, sweat gland formation. And uh, you said that there's a milialia in fax C1 deficient mice. Yeah. And when I think of milialia, I think of a syndrome called OFD1 which is a mutation in the seriopathy uh, pathways. And uh, yeah. th that's downstream of which is sonic hedgehog. So I was wondering if uh, I, my thought is in the right pathway. Yeah. Well, the, in this case, we've knocked out both of them. We don't know anything about how sonic hedgehog is working here. We know that glee and other patch and other genes are, are activated. We have no idea of what their action is. Um, Clearly, the evidence is that the FOXC1 itself is enough to give the condition. Uh, whether it requires sonic hedgehog itself to be activated is not clear. That's conceivable. Thanks. But, yeah. Any other question from younger generation? Maybe I'm the youngest. <laughs> Satisfied? No more? So, so my question is um, about the, for example, you all, all show the uh, uh, EDA 
uh, knock out in the developmental process. Mm -hmm. So I'm asking the acquire this function of EDA. In a model system, let the mouse develop normally. Then if you hit the EDA function afterwards, what happens? In other words, what is the role of EDA is maintaining uh, the hair follicle or sweat gland? There hasn't been much work on that. There is a little bit of work on uh, hair follicles and a claim that it changes the cycle uh, in the mouse. But uh, uh, I, I think it would be clearer in the, uh, uh, it could be investigated much more extensively. The point is that there's no way of making new sweat glands again. Most of these skin appendages are there and that's it. So there, there, there isn't any kind of stem cell action for the exocrine glands, as far as I can tell. Uh, but uh, it could, there could be surprises if we actually... So once sweat glands are developed, they stay there? They yeah. do not have any maintenance? I don't think so. There hasn't been much study of it, but uh, um, there are stem cells for the sweat glands, and even there, the work is very, very uh, sparse. Yeah, the work reason I asked that there was the acquired form of anhydrosis. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we don't know the patho pathophysiological mechanism. Yeah. So I was wondering, yeah. so for example, there are some autoimmunity against the EDA pro gene product or other related gene. And uh, uh, as a treatment, we provide some immunosuppressive yes. yeah. race, steroid or uh, pulse therapy. Or, so I was wondering what your model finding how could could be applied to the acquired possible, but uh, it, it, it's more likely immune, immune I yes. think. But uh, that's a guess. I mean, no one's done the experiment. Mm. Or any other question? If not, I want to, oh, last question then, yeah. <laughs> from younger generation. Uh, uh, to tabby mouse have no hair in tail. Yeah. Why? they have no hair in, only in tail? Well, because the tail is like the guard hair in the uh -huh. back. Uh -huh. Again, there are two separate pathways, yeah, yeah. one that's not EDA dependent. Uh -huh. That's the point. Okay. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. No, that's you, okay. you answered. That's, yeah, that's okay. I have a, uh, I, wasn't, I changed, I changed I, my, my question. My answer, <laughs> my answer wasn't clear. That's I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, so hu in human EDA patient, uh, they have uh, also uh, uh, sim symptoms in digestive organs, so, uh, so gastric organs or, or uh, others. Is it, uh, is it was, uh, it was considered to close related to the, considered to relate to the development of, uh, so gastric organ or digestive organ, but, uh, so fr I, from your, I, huh? <laughs> I wonder time. that there is no uh, phenotype of uh, glands in digestive organs. Well, we haven't looked, but I, as I remember it, when we did, the, we did look at expression, and the only place where we saw substantive expression outside of uh, uh, the skin appendages was uh, in heart. Um, but there's only one EDA patient who's been reported who also has a heart condition. That would certainly be within the realm of random population. So uh, it looks as if it's relatively specific. I don't know whether that could be secondary to other <coughs> features. But again, it hasn't been investigated in detail. Uh, I should point out, for example, that um, when we found the eye phenotype in Tabby, and we went to clinicians to ask them whether EDA patients suffered from dry eye, we were told, not necessarily, no, no, no. Then when they went back, they found very great dry eye, dry eye and essentially all EDA patients. So this was a case where the mouse model preceded uh, the uh, geneticist's look at the patients. Okay. okay. Another, another question. So before closing, I want to make a comment on uh, Dr. David Schwesinger.
because besides all the uh, uh, significant contribution to science, I, I was deeply impressed by his, how should I say, attitude to science, or his style to science, or he, his way of uh, leading his life. Because uh, Minoru uh, introduced his CV. And uh, so he uh, did the, uh, some uh, uh, basic education in Chicago and moved to St. Louis and uh, WashU. And he acted, or uh, uh, he did a professor and leading the uh, department and also formed the general center. And for 35 years, then at age of 60, at age of 60, he decided to move NIH, the East Coast. And it's been 20 years. And he presented the most of the work uh, on what he has done at NIH. This is really amazing that, you know, I'm 57, but at age of 60, how can I try to start a new life? The Middle West and East Coast, that itself is different, but also he tried to open or start the completely new uh, institute at NIH, and at that time the mineral was recruit recruited to Baltimore. So I think you know he's uh, you know it's really wonderful for us to have you as a, a visiting distinguished professor of Keio University, and just uh, interacting with you uh, inspired us a lot in many ways, and I really appreciate we really appreciate. Uh, your contribution to science on the, your, ex your visit to Keio University. So thank you very much again. Thank you.